creates in the body or it helps the body create serotonin. And serotonin is the chemical that's released by the brain and it plays a vital role in regulating our mood. (laughs) Some people need to eat some more turkey. It's also used, that same chemical is also used in creating melatonin, which does regulate our sleep and wake cycles. And so while there is a truth that tryptophan does help in the production of mood regulation and sleep inducement and waking, the problem is, and the myth exists, you'd have to eat a whole lot of turkey. Because there's more tryptophan in chicken than there is in turkey. Now, I just upset some of y'all. Because y'all have been using that excuse for that Thanksgiving nap. (laughs) The turkey made me do it. You've been using that for a long time. So here's the deal. According to dietitians, turkey really doesn't contain more tryptophan than other kinds of poultry. Less than chicken, less than many nuts and things that we eat. However, what happens at Thanksgiving is that we combine that turkey with a lot of other carb-loaded items like stuffing and dressing and breads and pies and cakes. I'm not going to say we overeat, but we eat usually more plates at that meal than we do on a normal meal. So between the bulk of goods and the combination, there is a desire to fall face first someplace and to sleep it out. Now, I'm not preaching against turkey. As a matter of fact, I'm perfectly fine blaming it on the turkey and the tryptophan. We'll just stick with it. But here's my philosophy. Grab another plate and an extra pillow. Let's eat and sleep. It's Thanksgiving. Here's the deal. It's a great holiday. This is a fabulous time of the year. Now, I'm not going to get on to anyone if they've already started decorating for Christmas. It's up to you. But I am going to say, don't cheat Thanksgiving by celebrating Christmas too early. I'll say that. Because sometimes what can happen is we get so excited about things that are coming that we miss what's in front of us. That's in every aspect of life. That's free today. That's not in the notes. You can just take that with you. But a lot of times we can be so busy planning ahead for things that often we miss many moments that are right in front of us. Now, I don't think if you've already decorated for Christmas that you're going to miss the power of Thanksgiving. I know that my tendency is that if I'm already decorated for Christmas, I'm thinking about Christmas more than I am Thanksgiving. So I have to pull the reins in. My kids want to decorate in July. They, they would Actually, they'd probably be fine just leaving trees up all year long and lights and uh, bows. and Really, they just want presents all year long, but that's just kind of... I guess part of raising kids, and we might all be in that same bucket. But here's the thing about Thanksgiving. Growing up, we learn about these four main food groups and how important they are to having a balanced life, right? And you have that pyramid and all that weird stuff that it's changed over time. It used to be different, and it's a little, it's it's changed a little bit uh, from when I was a kid, Uh, but it's still predominantly a few main food groups. And for me, Thanksgiving is the holiday that contains those four essential components for life. It's faith, it's family, it's food, and it's football. Now some of you aren't football fans, and while I'm not necessarily a diehard fan, I do enjoy an athletic contest every once in a while. Congratulations to the Dyersburg High School for moving forward toward the state championship. That's exciting. Um... I do enjoy a little football, but really all it does is provide a great backdrop for a good nap. (laughs) It's kind of like golf. I like playing it, but if it's on, I'm sleeping. It's just the way it is. And so while this holiday is in front of us, often we think about the family, and we think about the food, and we do think about the football, But the faith part of it is often just kind of the passing piece. It's in the name. I mean, Thanksgiving. It's it's kind of native to faith and, and the concept 
of faith. Fact is, it's usually centered around this concept of the pilgrims and the Indians, right? And, and a blessed meal and thanks for all of these things of helping and working together. But the reality is the concept of thanksgiving is rooted much further back than it was in the New World. It's rooted in the principles of Scripture of living a Christ-following life. But as a Christian, unfortunately, I don't get to just select a single day to practice that particular part of God's desire and design for my life. I'm supposed to pursue a lifestyle of giving thanks. It's a lifelong commitment. It's not celebrated one day each year, but instead it's lived out on a daily basis. Now, I am all for picking a day and making it the high and holy focus. I'm good with that. A lot of people go, well, you can't prove Christ was born on December the 25th. You're absolutely right. I can't. But I am going to celebrate it every day, and I'm going to pick one day, and I'm going to have a real big focus on it. Now, where our focus gets sideways, y'all get nervous now. He's like, boy, he's preaching on Christmas. We ain't even there yet. But a lot of times we do get caught up. In the hustle and the bustle and the chaos and the and we're going to talk about that going into December. We're excited about having a, a theme throughout the whole month. Every service is going to point us toward a, a culmination on that 19th. And I know that's not Christmas, so there's some things that follow it. I promise you, and we're excited about that. So you don't want to miss it. But we have to recognize that God has a lifestyle designed for Christians. It's never about just a one moment of attention. It's about the ability to daily make a commitment, daily follow after or pursue the things of God that draw us closer to Him. So today I want to take your attention to Luke chapter 17 for a particular story. And uh, I, I think it's really neat how Jesus illustrates quite often in His walk on earth all the different principles and practices that He requires of us or desires of us for when He's not present in the flesh. So Luke chapter 17 tells this particular story starting at verse 11. It says, and it came to pass that as he went to Jerusalem, he referring to Jesus, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. He kind of went between the towns and in this process of his journey, verse 12 says he enters into a certain village and he met 10 lepers which stood afar off. I'll pause here for a minute and reminds you that in the Old Testament, it gives us God's desire or design for how leprosy was to be handled within the children of Israel. That when someone was identified with a leprous spot, they had to go to the priest. And the priest had to examine that. And they had to determine, was the sickness just a superficial deal? Was it already into the bone? Or, yeah, I know it's kind of gross this morning, turkey and leprosy, but we'll get there. But they went through this examination process where they made a determination. Was this something that could be cleansed out through washing, through, uh, through a medical procedure? Or was this something that was deep enough that it was going to be a lasting effect? And in that case, then there were some drastic measures that had to be taken. That person, if they were examined and determined to be uh, full of leprosy or it had it progressed we might call that stage three or four in our day's diagnosis if it was far enough along they were put outside the camp they had to leave their families they had to leave their tribes they had to leave their homes and they had to wander around with a particular outfit on and if anyone came within eye shot or ear shot of them they had to yell out unclean unclean and and announce this disease that they had announced this incompleteness, this sickness that was killing them. And so what we find is as Jesus goes into this village, there were ten lepers. Because what would happen is when they would have to leave their home and their family, and they were doomed to die, a prognosis that was not going to turn itself around. It wasn't going to be corrected. They were in a terminal condition they would often congregate together outside of the towns. They would find one another, which is one of the most amazing and beautiful pictures of the reality that we as humans need connection. Even in terminal states, we need somebody in our lives. 
And so these ten men had gathered together, these ten lepers. And when Jesus comes into the village, he sees them from a distance, or at least they see him. So verse 13 says, they lifted up their voice, and instead of crying unclean, notice what happens. They ask for a touch. Jesus, Master, have mercy. And when he sees them or saw them, he says unto them, go show yourself to the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And Paul's there. <laughs> what an amazing story. A terminal condition. These men had been ostracized, had been put outside, had been excommunicated, had been told that there was no hope, no future, no... Some of you might be sitting in this house today having come in and someone has told you there's no hope, there's no future, you'll never be anything more than what your mom was or your dad was or your grandparents was, you're doomed to live out a generational curse or you're... Somebody might have walked in here today with a prognosis from a medical doctor that says it's stage 3 or it's stage 4 or it's terminal and there's no hope of it ever turning. I've got good news. We've got a God who turns things for good. It's that simple. And so the heat, Jesus walks in. These people cry out to him and say, have mercy on us. And he sees them and he just says, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went to the priest, they were cleansed. Now notice, cleansing in the Old Testament, the way it worked, the procedure was, if at any point they thought the sickness had taken care of itself or that there was signs of healing in the wounds, then they would go back to the priest and the priest would re-examine them and he would give them an all clear or a wait two more weeks or a come back and see me in a month. That's what he would do. And so here's the process. Jesus doesn't go outside of the law. He doesn't go outside of the tradition. He doesn't go outside. He just simply says, you're healed. Go tell the priest. Go show them. And as they go, they're cleansed. I want you to notice two things here. It wasn't at his word that they were cleansed. It was after they went. Because remember, they've been excommunicated. They've been told, stay outside of town. Don't, don't come back around people. Don't come back in to the place. And Jesus looks at them, and while it's the procedure, it's still weird to tell someone, go see the priest. Go back into town. Go to the temple. Find the priest. And show yourself to him. That goes against everything that these men have been living forever, how long they've been living it. I don't know how long they've been outside the camp. I don't know how long they've been with this disease. It could have been one month. It could have been five years. It could have been 40 years. I, I don't know. But what I do know is that Jesus says, go show yourself. And it says that it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. That tells me that often Jesus will speak a word into my mind, into my life, into my heart. But it will only come to pass if I'm willing to step out and move forward in what God is asking me or challenging me to do. It doesn't mean he hasn't spoken the word of healing over you. It doesn't mean he hasn't given provision or direction or power. What it means is it's still holding for you to step forward in response. And when you do, your miracle can be met with the motion that you put into it. It's an amazing story. They're cleansed. They're cleansed. Imagine looking down at this disease that is eating away your body and noticing that it has stopped. Imagine the pain. Medical scientists tell us that leprosy creates what we kind of call now neuropathy or that constant continual pain. So it was always in pain because something was always dying. Something in them was always dying. And so there was a constant pain. Whether it was a burn, whether it was an ache, whether I don't know. But what I do know is there was a constant reminder in their body that things were not going good. And Jesus says you're cleansed. Imagine if it was step one and all of a sudden their feet start feeling better. And they're like, Are, hey, um, did, do you, did, you, did you feel something different? One of them looks over and says, I, 
I can't explain it, but like the numbness in my feet, is, it's gone. I, my knees aren't, wow, and the hips are, I don't under, I, are, you, are you feeling, are you noticing that? And they're, they're talking, they're engaging. I can imagine the pace is picking up. <laughs> I imagine what once was a go show yourself and it was a hesitant step starts to become a pretty faithful gallop. <laughs> They're moving quickly. Things are happening. Things feel different. All of a sudden there's dexterity and there's flexibility and there's not this pain and this ache and this burn. And they are going and going and going. And at some point on the road to see the priest, we hit this realization in verse 16 or 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. And with a loud voice, he glorified God. And then notice what happens. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. I love the way the Bible does this. (laughs) The details of what's happening here help us understand this progressive power that shows itself in the revelation of who God is and who he touches and how he touches I'm going to have trouble finishing this message because the Holy Ghost is all over me. I'm going to tell you. If you're in this house and you need something, you don't need to leave here needing it. It is present to do. Verse 15, he saw he was healed. He's talking to Joe and Frank and Bill and they're walking back through here and all of a sudden one of them goes, man, I, I just I feel great for me. This is the best I have felt in years. And they're just, man, they're so excited. And one of them in that moment realizes it. That guy, that Jesus, that master that we called out to, I just asked him to have mercy on me. I didn't ask him to heal me. I didn't ask him to stop at all. But he's done something in me that's beyond just a touch. It's from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head. Y'all go ahead. I'll be right there. And he turns back. And in that moment, he looks into the face of this Christ. And he says, I glorify you. I'm so thankful. And he falls on his feet, on his face at Jesus' feet. Imagine that's the context and the setting for this next verse. Man cleansed, healed. On his face, in the dirt, giving thanks, crying out, glorifying God. Verse 17 says, and Jesus said, but weren't there ten? <laughs> you got to see what Jesus is doing here. He just gave the same healing to ten people. He just reversed the effects of a terminal disease for ten people. He just took 10 people who knew what each other had in common and he radically changed all 10 of them at one word. One word. And he is in shock, not just that only one of 10 would give thanks, but that this one would be the Samaritan. Now you've got to remember, in Jewish culture, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. They disliked the Gentiles greatly, but they hated the Samaritans because the Samaritans were a result of a race mix between Jews and Gentiles. It's one thing if you're totally different than me, but it's another thing if you're trying to blend what I am into something that I am not. And they hated that. That's the context of the scripture. So Jesus calls it out. To our attention, or at Luke, Luke records it this way. One guy comes back and impresses Jesus Christ so much. Oh, and by the way, he was a Samaritan. I don't know what the other nine were. Now, I know all ten of them knew where the temple was because they were headed that way. So Jesus is standing here looking at this man who is cleansed on his face in the dirt. Giving thanks. Glorifying God. And he goes... Weren't there ten? Where are the other nine? Now he knows where the other nine are. He just told them to go to the temple. It lets me know that God gives us expect our instruction, but he has expectations. He'll always tell us.
what he desires, but he'll expect what he deserves. And it's important that we don't look ahead to get to where he told us to go. (laughs) And we go incorrectly. We go without recognizing what we're supposed to do. Oh, you know, God, I'll get to you on Thanksgiving. Don't worry, there's a day coming when we'll have a celebration and and me and my family will get together and we'll celebrate that day I met you on the road and you turned my life around. You you allowed me to go back home and celebrate that holiday with my family. One of these days, once a year, we'll, we'll put the paws on and we'll remember to give thanks. Weren't there nine more? Where are they? Verse 18, verse 18, he continues answering his own self. They're not found. Only one returned to give glory to God. This stranger. Just one. You can go try to catch the nine. They're probably already running home. Because they were cleansed. They're going to go show themselves to the priest. And the priest is going to go, I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't understand it. But the leprosy spots, there, it's, it's white and the, it's coming out. It's not red. It's not, there, there's a healing that has happened. I don't understand it. I can't fathom it. And they're going to go, how did this happen? And the guys are going to go, we talked to Jesus. And they're going to go, hey, go home and don't tell people that. Ain't nobody going to believe that. Nobody's going to believe that you were in this kind of situation. And one prayer, one word, one thought, one faith step resulted in this. Hey, that, we don't believe in those miracle kind of things. We don't think that stuff happens. That was for a time or a place, not a God. <laughs> we serve a God who is not limited by time and place. We're serving a God who is outside the bounds of Old Testament and New Testament. He was in the beginning and he will be in the end. He forever was and he forever will be. Which means I can stand in faith today and tell you that he'll heal you just like he did them. He'll give you strength. He'll give you power. And he'll give you instruction. But he will have expectations. They can't find them. They they didn't come back. Just this one. All this is happening while the guy's on his face giving thanks. Verse 19 says, and he, Jesus, says to the guy, get up, arise, go your way. This is important. Your faith has made thee whole. He changed his direction and he changed his destiny. Because he came back and gave thanks. Remember, the instruction given to the ten when they first asked to be touched was go show yourself to the priest. Because the priest has to examine the results of the sickness to determine whether or not it's still going. But this guy, after he gets up off of giving thanks in the dirt, Jesus says, go your way, go home. Don't go to the priest. You don't have to because you're made whole. Wholeness is a whole different ballgame because leprosy isn't just a terminal disease. It ate away and it destroyed and things would die and they would fall off and they would disappear and you would meet lepers or you would see people suffering with leprosy that would lose an ear or lose a nose or they'd lose fingers or digits and it would eat away. It was gone. There's a difference in living your life with the scars of a sickness that was once terminal. And there's a whole nother ball game when God puts it all back together again. You don't have to go show the priest that the leprosy is over when there is no leprosy and no results and no effects and no scars and no leftovers and no signs. And Some of you are sitting there on me this morning and everything inside of you is wanting to cry out to that God. I'm telling you. You are in a place where Jesus Christ will pause at the mention of his name. And when it leaves your lips, you can meet an amazing master who can say, go be cleansed. But not just that. If you respond, not just follow instructions, but if you respond with what he really desires to be thanked and to be loved and to be (laughs) sought out, he will give you something that's beyond comprehension. Because when this guy went home, he went home as if he had never been sick. He went, can you imagine, can you imagine, let's wait a couple of weeks. They're walking around town, we'll call this one Tim, since Tim's right there. So Tim has gotten the wholeness healing. 
He's got to go home. He didn't even have to go to the priest. He probably knocks on the door and his family is wigging out. They're flipping. They're like, what is going on? Why are you here? You were, wait a minute. You don't look sick. What's going on? And he walks them through this process. Now imagine Bob and all the others we mentioned a while ago. The other nine. They go to the priest. The priest examines them. They don't see the leprosy growing, so the priest goes, I think you're good. you got to wait two more weeks. you got to quarantine. Is that what they had to do? Quarantine for two more weeks, and then you can return home if all is still good. So two weeks later, they come back after their quarantine, and the priest looks again and goes, no, nope, it hasn't grown. It's the same. You've got the same scars. It's not worse. It's back. Oh, man, I can't believe it. This is amazing. Go home and tell your family. You can move back into society. So imagine a month later, all of a sudden they're in town at a festival. It's Thanksgiving. It's time for everybody to get together and have faith and family and food and whatever ball they played. And so here they are. And all of a sudden here's Bob and Ted and Jim and Bill and all them with their families. And hey, so good to see you. And I can't, I'd shake your hand, but I only got one finger. And, you know, and they're... They're going through this because they're healed, but they're not whole. They're healed, but they're, they still lost stuff. They lost time. They lost relationship, but they lost physically. It's not who they were before they left. They come back with more than just a healing. They have scars. They have stories of having to live outside the camp and what it was like those first few weeks when they were completely alone and didn't have anyone and then finally they found one other person in the same condition as them and then that two grew into four and before you know it we had this collective of ten that kind of partnered together and took care of one another and we made it. We were living out there and we were, we were making it work until we died and maybe there was twelve at the beginning but we had to bury two along the way and they're telling these stories. They're back together. It's reunion time. And it's nine of them, and everybody's looking around going, well, where's Tim? We all got the same healing. Why is Tim not here? And then all of a sudden, Tim comes walking in with his family. And they don't even recognize him. Wait a minute. What's going on with Tim? Why does he look? Tim used to not. Wait a minute. His ear. That, that can't be Tim. I mean, I, I was missing an ear, and I'm still missing it, but that's Tim. Imagine when Tim comes over and gives him a hug. He's like, guys, so good to see you. I'm so glad you got to go back to your... Isn't it great what God has done? Oh, my goodness. And they're going, wait a minute. Something's different, Tim. What happened? I, I just turned around and gave thanks. I, I didn't ask for anything else. I wasn't expecting anything more. I just simply recognized a good God. And I gave him glory. And I thanked him for what he had done in my life. And it didn't matter that in my circumstance and in my situation, I still had things I was going to have to deal with and processes I was going to have to go through and things that I might still have to talk about for a long time because everybody's going to look at me a little weird from now on and everybody's going to remember what happened there. I wasn't thinking of all of that. I just turned around and I said, thank you. I chose to be thankful. And in the choice, he rose me up and he made me whole. It's an amazing process. It's an amazing story. As a minister, I often am confronted with people in a very positive way who love God and are searching in his word and following after his spirit. And they will often come with this question, how do I know what the will of God is for my life? Because we preach it. We have to subject our will to his will. That's the way Jesus taught us to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's about this putting our will down so that his will can be fulfilled. Everything inside of Tim wanted to run back to the priest and then get home as quickly as he could, which would have been about three weeks. But instead, because everything inside of him wanted to do one thing, but he chose to do something else what God deserved, then God made him whole and he went home that day. Looking for the will of God, I, 
I don't, I don't know what it is he wants me to do. I know I'm supposed to serve him. I know I'm supposed to do this. What, what is it his will? What is his will for my life? It's a very sincere question. It's a pursuit that all of us desire. It's something that we want to know. Because if I just knew what his will was, it would be a lot easier for me to put all of mine down and go, that, let that be done. 1 Thessalonians, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, dealing with some things that are going on there. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16, it says, Rejoice evermore. Wow, what a simple verse. <laughs> Didn't use a lot of ink on that one. Rejoice evermore. Then it goes to 17. He gets verbose in this one. Pray without ceasing. <laughs> I mean... He must have really been in prison in this one. <laughs> he didn't have much time to write. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Now notice, each of those verses have periods on the end of them. I and mean, we talked about this. That's, that's the end of a thought. It's a command. It's a direct statement. It's not a continuation. But then verse 18, he gets excited. Rejoicing, praying. And then he goes, in everything give thanks. Colon. In other words, listen up, because here's why you do it. Because it is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you ever want to know what the will of God is for your life, start with what he has said his will for all of our lives are. It starts with giving thanks. There are certain people, you could literally give them a gift horse and they would look it in the mouth. Isn't that the saying? Never look a gift horse in the mouth? You could give someone the most powerful present. You could give them whatever it is, and they will quickly run away to play with it or run away to enjoy it, or, and they'll never pause to give thanks. We as parents see this quite often in our children. On Christmas, we'll just use that since we're here. They get lost in bows and ribbons and paper and all this stuff that we've spent all this time on and effort on, right? And they've got it open in like three seconds, and then they... They're looking at the toy, and if it's not the one they wanted, they'll be quick to tell you. This isn't the gift I asked for. I mean, I like it. It's, it's great. Or they'll start, they'll just run off with it if it's the one they want, right? You, you'll, they're gone. It's interesting, this happens with older people too. I guess it's that second childhood. My grandfather, after he turned 70, every gift he got, when he would open it, he would just get up and leave the room. Literally. He was all there. He just got up and left the room. Finally, one day, I just followed him. I was like 10. I'm walking behind him. He goes into the bedroom. He takes this gift and puts it on this spot over here. And then he comes back out. He sits down. He opens his next one. I'm like, What in the world is he doing? He opens this gift. Gets up. Goes to a different place, puts this one down, comes back, opens the next one. After the third one, I finally just went, what, what are you doing? Like, what's going on? He goes, well, the ones I don't like, I put over there. The ones I do like, I put over there. And the ones I want to deal with right now, I go play with. And he'll literally lose one gift at a time. There's a reality to this truth that often... When we receive something, we're overwhelmed with the receipt so much that we quickly move past the thing. It happens. It's this overwhelming human nature inside of us to think we deserve certain things sometimes. Or perhaps in the context of how we're raised or where we're raised, that we've earned this in some way or that this is just not good enough for me even. Why would I give thanks for something I didn't want? Anybody ever got those gifts? <laughs> Don't raise your hands. Please don't. I did that one time and I, anyways. You know, somebody's grandmother always knits and somebody's grandmother crochets and somebody's grandfather whittles and somebody, and we all get gifts that we're like, thank you. I know this took a lot of time. I'll never wear it or play with it, but I appreciate it. We're there. Sometimes we buy gifts that we know they won't like because we want them. I've done this with my kids. I wanted a particular gift. I knew they wouldn't play with it, but if they got it, then it could stay around the house. Oh, y'all are tough on me this morning. 
in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And just in case you were unsure, it's concerning you. <laughs> when you read it, you can't read it any other way. Wait, concerning me? Concerning you. I know it was written to the church at Thessalonica. I know it was written in context at a time. But the principles of this concept extend into Christian life from Thessalonica all the way to Finley. It's an expectation of how God deals with people. And when you go through scripture and you find people who are willing to pour themselves out at Jesus' feet, they're marked for history. You think about the woman with the alabaster box. And how other people didn't understand her praise. Didn't understand what she was willing to sacrifice on the feet of this Christ. This pouring on the head and the anointing the feet. And what was it that Jesus said? His very words recorded. He said, everywhere that I'm spoken of, they'll remember this lady. This will show up. And we sing songs about it today. It's amazing. How when people put themselves in a posture of praise at the feet of Jesus, good things happen. Good things happen. Won't you stand with me? It's Thanksgiving. We're going to stuff ourselves with stuffing. We're going to tryptophan ourselves with turkey. We're going to sleep. We're going to eat. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have fun with family and friends. There'll be moments during this holiday where we have to deal with the fact that some we've lost people. There's going to be moments of pain. There's going to, we're going to move through this season and we're going, to, we're going to do it. It's what we do. You go. You move forward. But if we could ever remember that there's a principle of giving thanks and that when people truly give thanks without direction, without instruction, simply in response to an amazing God, that he does things that are not on the menu. He makes things happen that not everybody gets to be a part of. doesn't mean you're better than them. It just means there's deeper rewards that exist for people who pursue Christ at a deeper level. He recognized, were there not ten? You know what that says to me? I would have made all ten of them whole. They had turned around. Do you think he was only, or he only had enough wholeness for one of ten? <laughs> I think he was more amazed by the fact that the ten didn't come back because he was ready to take them to the next level. I think he was more shocked that he wasn't able to create wholeness in ten than he was about the fact that one would only say thanks. His expectation, I'm telling you, is that he does good things for good people. It says this, good gifts, every good gift comes from God. Every one of them. If there is anything in your life that has a connotation of being good, you should recognize God in it. And if you do and you thank him for it and you praise him for it, even if he didn't have anything to do with it, he's going to do good things in your life. <laughs> I'm reminded of a story of a lady who was hungry. She was doing without. It had been a while. She often prayed like Daniel. Many of you may have heard this story with the windows open three, four, five times a day would pray. And there was these two neighborhood kids that was always going by the house playing and stuff in the neighborhood. And they would hear her praying and kind of make fun of her or mock her or, or oh, I wonder what she's praying about today. And one day they heard her praying for bread, praying for bread. God, if you'd just give me some bread, I could make it. I've, it's been days. And so they being... Uh, a little cantankerous went down to the store and bought a loaf of bread and snuck under the window and they waited and she prayed again God if you'd just give me bread and they threw it in the window and she started celebrating God you're so good you've provided you've given you're so amazing and these little boys start laughing and snickering and they raise up and they go ha ah, that wasn't God that was us and without missing a beat she just said thank you God for using the devil to bring me bread I'm telling you, there's something about an attitude of gratitude. When it grabs a hold of you, and you can say thank you for the smallest things, and you can pause in the middle of things that seem meaningful. It was important to get to the temple and show them I was cleansed. But if you can catch yourself and rein yourself back in for just a moment to go, God, you're so good. I don't know what the end result is. I'm, I'm on my way, I promise. But i, I got to turn back for a moment and just say thank you. 
Why don't you just close your eyes for a moment? I'm just going to ask you. This altar is open. This is a safe place. It's a place where you can step out, where you can take one step in faith. That's all it took. He turned and came back one step, fell on his face, and God said, wow, you're whole. I don't know what you need from God today. I know every one of us needs some of the same kind of things. We're all going to need comfort at some point because we're going to be dealing with situations that cause us discomfort. We're all going to need healing at some point because there's no way you make it through this life without a few scars and bangs uh, and hurts. It just happens. And so we need healing at times. I know we all need salvation because every one of us have to live a life that is marred in sin. But we have a faithful God. I don't know what you need. I don't know if your kids are lost. I don't know if your bank account's dry. I don't know if your job is failing. I don't know if your marriage is crumbling. I don't know. And maybe you walked in here today and you were just coming to the temple to show yourself because good things have happened. (laughs) I would challenge you. However you found yourself in this house today, I would take a moment before you left and I'd get on your face, either at least figuratively, if not literally, and I would glorify God. And I would give him thanks for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. The same psalmist who said, I'll praise him on the harp and the psaltery and the ten strings. It's what we open with, Psalm 92. It's a good thing to give thanks. It's a good thing to sing praises. It's a good thing to show forth the love and kindness in the morning and faithfulness at night. I'll do it upon the instruments of ten strings because he was a harpist. He was a psalmist. He would play and he would sing and he would give God glory. And I don't know what instrument you have or what ability you have, but if there's breath in you, you should praise the Lord. If your hands work, you should give him a hand clap. If your heart in you is longing for God to do something good, this altar is a great place to find your moment and make a solemn sound before him as the psalmist said. Well, as they sing, I invite you, come to the altar. Make an altar in your pew. Don't leave this house without glorifying God and giving him some thanks today. Hallelujah. done for